Hey everybody, Chandler Bolt here, and our guest today is Steve Windsor. Now, like a cross between Andrew Bash, Dexter, and James T. Kirk, Amazon bestselling author Steve Windsor has been pumping out some of the wildest, most controversial, and irreverent thriller books that you'll ever want to admit that you secretly love. And in his spare time, he writes author how-to books on how he does it. Now, Steve um, is one of the early students here at Self-Publishing School. He's been one of the most successful students in Self-Publishing School. And this guy is just a writing machine. I mean, we all aspire to be, A, as good a writer as he is, and B, pumping out as much writing as he is, because this guy's a machine, and it's no nonsense, no BS. What you see is what you get, and this guy's pumping out words. So I'm really excited in this interview to dive into how he does what he does. So we'll, we'll kind of dive into two parts here. So we'll have the fiction side and we'll have the nonfiction side because he has experience with both. And there are some differences. There are some similarities. We can talk about writing habits, things like that. But at the end of the day, it's whatever avenue you choose so that you can write that book as quickly and as high quality as possible. So Steve, welcome, brother. It's great to have you here. We've been on a thousand of these hangouts. Um, yeah, how's it going, man? Love, love to see you. Um, looking forward to dicing it up. Let's go. Cool. Well, let's do it. So let's let's take it back to kind of. We'll start where you got your start with your writing, and then we'll get into more tactical stuff. So take us back to the beginning, and what sparked you to want to be a writer, and then how did you foster that, and kind of the creation of the first book? It's it's funny because I just wrote about this in in the latest book called that that I published called Author Phobia, which was the story of kind of how, and I kind of defaulted into, back into writing. And it was really my wife that that uh, finally said, I was interviewing at all these Silicon Valley powerhouses. I was in IT for 20 years. I interviewed with Google for about a day and a half. And I thought I had it locked up. And then all of a sudden I got that, you know, you get your Google t-shirt that says, I almost made it. And that's like almost as good as like getting hired by Google. Um, so I came home and I was really frustrated and, and I, was, I was starting to like withdraw inside myself. And my wife was like, you know, you always talk about writing. You're a good writer and you, you just keep saying it and saying it and saying it. You're, you're good at anything that you try to do. Why don't you just go down and write? I'm going to give you tomorrow all day. Why don't you go to the coffee shop and just write? And I'm like, I'm like you can't tell me what to do. You know, I'm not, <laughs> not going to do that. That's because you said. Um, <laughs> And, and really, so, so the next day I kind of went down and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I went, but I went to a coffee shop like five in the morning and this ended up becoming my routine where I would go to a coffee shop before it opened and I would sit in the car with my laptop for about 15 minutes watching them turn all the lights on. And, and then I would, I would get in the coffee shop, get, get a coffee, sit in the corner and I would just like let myself go inside writing and I would just not care what I wrote. The first book I actually wrote was this psychotic, like 40,000 words I wrote of just me talking to me. And I said, okay, you suck right now. What, what are you going to do about not sucking? Because you, you have two people here. You can either be awesome, Steve, or you can be a totally sucky version of yourself. Which one do you want? And then I let the one, you know, my one, my suck self say, oh, you know, I can't, do any of this. This is just, it's not fair. And it's not, and, and, you know, I, 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 so I had this conversation back and forth and I got the idea from, um, this book called conversations with God. Okay. And this author wrote it and he, he was really down and he was, uh, he was battling alcoholism and all this stuff. And he basically said, you know, ask God. And all of a sudden this voice in his head and it, which, you know, presumably was God. But anyway, so I got the idea from that, which was I just wrote for three days straight in a coffee shop. And at the end of it, I had answered like all the questions for myself that I wanted to have answered by a better version of who I was, just by being truthfully honest. And I didn't care. I've still got that 40,000 words on a, in a Word doc on my laptop. And I'm like, it'll never see the light of day. But that's how I learned to just like crank words as hard. And, and really it was rip off every filter because I had read a book by Natalie Goldberg called um, Wild Mind. And she was, it was basically like rip off your filter, rip off everything, every social grace you have and just keep it. It's called your monkey mind. Keep your monkey mind out of it and let your wild mind roll. So, so I, I mean, my best stuff is done in 12 hours in a coffee shop and that's, like my style of writing, which I think 
that the, and, and I've always found this in things that I do, like the common wisdom of pacing yourself and going slow and just have, developing a habit. Those things never resonate with me because I'm a very project oriented person and I like to see the, the finished product. So yeah. I kind of developed my writing style around this idea that the finished product you can work with, but if you don't have anything, then you can't work with anything. And exactly. so I like to get the finish, finished product out as quickly as I could. And it's not a finished product, right? It's a rough, rough draft, which every, every draft is rough anyway. You might as well get it quick so you can go back in and fix it. Um, that. And that, that became my writing philosophy. Um, so before I got to self-publishing school, when, when, um, when you and I met, uh, I started writing my first fiction book and I just dove in and did it like I would learn technology because when I, when I learned technology, it was after I'd already been to MBA school and undergrad. And so I had to go back into learning technology and it was all about, you know, three inch thick manuals of technical material that you have to scour through 10 times before you get it. Um, and that's what I did with writing. I just consumed everything I could get my hands on and I started learning about, you know, dialogue and structure and, and, and story structure and, and things like that from places I could find on the internet. Cause I, you can consume a lot of stuff on the internet. Um, so I actually have two and a half novels and the, my first real novel was like 250,000 words. It was just insane. I had all, I have a, I have an ancestral map of 33 characters in a spreadsheet uh, and who their kids are and how they all match up and match together. So that one was like, my ones that you've seen me write, that's why they go so fast because they're just trivial compared to like that first insane, it was, like a, it was like a Game of Thrones style, that many characters in their own arcs. And I, I just made it that complicated because I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to go nuts, right? Um, and I created all these different groups of people that were converging on this central theme. Um, and, and it's kind of a sci-fi mashup uh, series. Uh, and I got to go back and edit it, but it, it's it's sitting there. There's like half a million words of that before I even hit the self-publishing school where I was kind of like I half published it and I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I, I, I figured out the mechanics of Kindle and CreateSpace, but I had no clue how to market books, you know, and I had no clue what the market wanted or or how to package it or what to make it look like. I just was learning by doing Um and, and I think that the reason I can pump out words so well is because I block off large blocks of time. I let myself get immersed in what I'm doing. And then my word count gets up to, I think I've gotten up to about 1,500 words an hour before. But that's after you have done all that mental work to change over from observing and seeing the physical reality world to imagining in your head in pictures this world that you've created in your mind and you're really just describing it as you're watching it. So my fingers try to keep up with characters as they rip through scenes where I'm like, Oh yeah, that's cool. I know what that, I know exactly what that looks like and here's what it looks like. And so it, it's very immersive to me. I feel like I need to just really like shove myself into the world, stay in there and not, I get angry when I have to come out. And so I've, I've had to stand up at like 1 p.m. in a coffee shop and go, oh, my God, my legs hurt, my, you know, my arms hurt, my back hurts because I'm hunched over my, my laptop. And, I, and I've really got to I, I gotta pee really bad because I, because I drank all that coffee, but I wouldn't let myself, you know, use the restroom. So it's kind of like, oh, man. Um, and people were, people were, when I started writing books about this, people would get mad. You know, they got mad at me for saying, yeah, you know, I pumped out 15,000 words yesterday. And, you know, you can't do that and make it worth anything. It, you, there's no way you can do quality in that. And then I finally felt a little vindicated. No, even though uh, there are a lot of people who like my books, you know, there's some people who are like, oh, I hate this. But a lot, a, there's a lot of fans who like my books. Um, but I found a guy, um, Russell Blake. He does the, it's called the Jet Series. It's a pulp uh, pulp space fiction um, genre on Amazon. And he's done like, I don't know, three or four of these jet, no, he's done like 10 jet episodes and it's about a female assassin. So it's very cliched stuff. But I found a blog post he put up the other day and he did 40 books, 43 books in 40 months. And 
uh, he talks about how he talked about the same philosophy. He's like, look, you, you know, a, a novel is going to take you 90 hours or a hundred hours to finish. You can do that by spacing it over a year, two years or one month or two days or a week. I don't care how long it takes you. It's going to take you that amount of time. You know, the faster you get it done, the, the, the quicker you can move to, you know, that second draft edit, which is what, you know, which is what's going to turn it into uh, reality and, and a more, a more enjoyable draft. Right. Um, and, and let me just jump in here for a second. Steve. Yeah. I, I love that. And that was kind of a similar approach that my brother and I took with our very first book that we ever wrote, which was breaking out of a broken system. We said, Hey, we live, we lead busy lives. Um, he's traveling with the rock and roll band need to breathe. Um, I was running the business and all that stuff. So we said, Hey, we're going to crunch this down to a week and we're going to get that rough draft done. And then, iterate after that. And I think that really helped for us. And so there's these, these two polarizing opinions, right? There's kind of yours and I school of school of writing, which is blocking it out and mowing through it. But then there's also what we teach in self-publishing school, which is a little bit more pace because quite frankly, that's what most people can handle. Most people have a job, they have commitments, they have things like that where yeah. they have to do 30 minutes to an hour a day and consistently knock that out over the span of 15 to 30 days. Um, before we get into more writing strategies um, and dive into some of the strategies that that you use, I want to jump back just a little bit and you said something that that caught my attention early, which was you had to answer these questions to yourself in that 40,000 word block that you typed out in those three days. What were some of those questions that were coming up in your mind and some of those kind of things that you had to get past? I, I think that, I, I think the, they were common themes that everybody asked them at a certain, everybody asked themselves at a certain point in their life. And it really was this, it was a self-help book in the truest, most literal sense of a self-help book. I wrote a book to help myself figure out what I wanted to do and what, it, what I, who I wanted to be in life. And we, and I, and I see a lot of the students come through the school who are, who, who are reinventing themselves, right? And, and they're trying to figure out what they really want to do. And the question I was asking myself is like, who are you? Do you really want to go back into IT and, and be in these startups that are soulless and, and about making money and crushing people as they go? Or do you want to go do something fulfilling for yourself, for your, for your family? Um, you know, do, are you willing to put in the hardcore work you know it's going to take to go from zero to something? And, and that's a big question for people because I think we all get caught in this rut of I'm comfortable, I'm okay if I have to give up this $100,000 a year job and go do something I love, man, that's going to just suck. And I'm not going to be able to go to barbecues and be able to go to Disneyland and I can't go to Hawaii every year because I won't have that kind of money. And the problem is we do all those things because we're miserable at work, you know, and we use that hundred thousand to, to get, oh, it's like therapy money. You get, you go to, you go to misery school all day, every day at your job. And then you get this therapy money that you have to go spend on therapy or you're going to be too miserable to go back to it. So for 50 weeks a year, you go to misery school at your job. And then for two weeks, they let you out of the cage and say, go wander around a little bit and pretend that you're happy coming back. And that's what we do. And that's what we've outlined as a system. So I kind of like really did some hardcore introspection on that. And, and what I came up with at the end was, no, I don't want to go back to that. It's going to be difficult to recreate all that money that I was I'm literally, I was making, I was making upper six figure money. It was good money. Um, but, it, but, each day I saw stuff and participated in stuff that I didn't really want to. And, and it became this, it became a soul sucker. Uh, and, and as you know, in, well, you may, you may or may not know, I, I ran software as a service um, systems, which are, which are online 24 seven environments and, and uh, had a crew of people that worked for me that were awesome people, but we worked 24 hours a day. You know, if, if the, Texts go off. We get out of bed. We go. We go down to a data center somewhere, and we stay there all night and fix it, or we stay there all weekend and fix it because it's the company's money that's being affected anytime that system's down. So you're really on twenty four seven call. I mean, I've left Christmas and I've left Thanksgiving and I've I had left every major thing that was going on because a pager went off and said this has to be done right now, and that just wasn't 
that just wasn't the lifestyle I wanted to lead. And, you know, it would have been one thing if I was doing that for something that I truly believed in and truly loved, but it was a totally different thing to do it for just money. And I know that sounds, it sounds weird. Cause right now, even, even right now, I'm just like, yeah, I just like some money. I just like a, bit, a little bit of that money back. Um, but it, it, it was, it was very, very soul searching question. So I think I had to figure out my why, why do you want to go write? Why do you think you can learn to write? Because at the time I couldn't, and I knew it, uh, or commercially, what you really, what you really mean, what everybody really means by can I write is they're asking themselves a different question. They're saying, can I commercially write so that someone will want to read my stuff and pay me money for it? That's the real very specific question that everybody asks because everybody writes. I mean, you and I had this conversation about language and everybody learns to talk when, when they grow. Nobody says, well, you're not allowed to talk because you can't speak. No, because I've, I've spoken my whole life. Well, you've written your whole life too. It's simply another mechanism, mechanism of communication that you have to learn how to be professional at it but you have done it your entire life. You have written, everyone has written. You fill out a job application, you've written. You make a resume, you've written. You know, you write a letter to somebody, you've written. Blog post, anything that you write down, you have written and you have, that is a creative act and it's a communication act. So it's not necessarily that we say, can I write? Because absolutely you can write. What everybody wants to know is, can I write so that other people will, will want to hear what I have to say? That's great. And let's, let's fast forward a little bit. So join self-publishing school. You got the, the draft out of the way. You got your first book. You're kind of moving through there. How many, how many fiction books do you have so far? Uh, if you want to count the two and a half, you know, the, the, the two and a half million or the, the about 500,000 words that I have not published, um, and the ones that I published two in the first pub round of the of the um, self-publishing school. I published two novels that were like 90,000, 100,000 words a piece. Wow. And um, since then, three more. So I've got five published and um, I'm coming up on the fourth nonfiction book published now. Uh, so nine books total pu that are published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and how long of a span was that? Since when did, when did we start? It, it was six, seven eight, eight months. Like it's book, it's a book a month. It's been a book a month published. So I would write these books. Like I would crank them out, you know, and I'd be posting my word count in Slack and people would be like, that is just killing me. I barely wrote a thousand words today. And I'd be like, well, yeah, I did about 17,000 today. And, um, so, so I wrote, I would write the books in a little over a week, maybe 10 days ish like that. And then, switch gears into marketing publishing or in well switch gears into editing and and uh reviewing the stories and and making sure that they all trued up and then going into the editing process and then the book marketing process those all take much longer for me than writing the actual books so since starting self publishing school you know four to five fiction books and and i'm starting my fifth non-fiction book right now uh but i just and I, I, I real, realized something early on when we were all talking about, you know, how to make these into businesses. It's just you were going to write more books. You're not writing one book. If, if you want book writing to be a mechanism for you to go forward and, and use writing as a, as a revenue stream or, or a career or something, you're going to write more than one book. Because if you get fans, you want to write more stuff for them to read. Um, Absolutely. And let's and let's really, dive into let's dive into how some of your methods. And I want to start on the fiction side since that's where you first started. Then we'll be able to hop over into nonfiction, and then we can also talk about why you switched and how those both look like in parallel. Because now you're writing both. Um. So, but first, let's start with the not with the sorry the fiction side of things and dive into those writing methods and how were you writing seventeen thousand words a day? So I read. I read an awesome book by Larry Brooks called Story Engineering. And, I, and for me, I'm an analytic, you know, I was in technology. I'm a very analytical and math oriented person. And I, and I wanted to understand because the, there was structure to fiction stories. There's, there's structure to fiction stories. If you watch a movie, once you learn story structure and you watch any movie for the rest of your life, you will always go, oh, there it is. There's the first plot point. Oh, there it is. The hero has to run for his life. 
Oh, there it is. Something dies in there. Oh, there it is again. And the whole world changes. And he, oh, he fights back and loses. Oh, and now he figures out what he needs to know. And then he turns around and goes after the bad guy. But he almost gets killed every single time. And then he all somehow turns around and defeats the bad guy because the bad guy starts monologuing. And I started looking at this going, my God, why do villains monologue? Why don't they just shoot the hero in the head when they got the chance? Right there, part three, they just, you know, shoot the hero and they would, and that's it. The bad guy wins. But that's a horrible story. So the, so the bad guy never, ever, ever will, will like kill the good guy when he has the chance right there to do it. I mean, like tied up to a chair in a warehouse. He's got a gun to his head. I'm like, pull the trigger. It's over. Story's over. You're going to win. And he's like, nope, I'm going to tell you about how I was maligned as a child and why I turned <laughs> Oh, look, you turned around and got me. So, and you look at your watch and you're like, I want to think that it ends, but I know that there's 45 more minutes of this movie. Yeah. And it doesn't, but that's not a satisfying story for people who want the hero to win. So somehow the hero gets out of the warehouse and he always, you know, and even in romance. So people, people started saying to me in romance, romance doesn't work that way. Oh no, that's not true. Because, because guy meets girl, girl may like guy a little bit. And then all of a sudden girl finds out guy was a bad person and leaves him and he has to fight back and win her back. Right. So then by part three, he's like reformed himself and, and tries to win her back. But all of a sudden her ex-boyfriend shows up and then that's defeat in part three. And then he turns around and does something really nice and exposes that her boyfriend is some kind of mean person, blah, blah, blah. And then he wins in the climax battle scene. Okay, there you go. It's the same damn stuff. All of, and Hollywood knows this. Screenwriters know this. Story writers know this. It's a it's a formula that you put in now, and everybody and the formula is always broken. You it's broken in in different ways and different styles. Um, but the way I learned it was the way that helped me. First, you got to first you got to craft a story, right? You learn the basics. You craft a story all the way through that hits the right points that leaves somebody saying, "Oh yeah, that was pretty decent." And after that, then you get better with each one. One of the points I just made in in my last writing book was. Your first novel probably suck. So what? Because you just started writing novels. Write the thing, get it packaged up, get it put out to the best of your ability, and then move on and write a better one because that's what practice is about. The one-hit wonders, the J.K. Rowlings who come out and write Harry Potter, that stuff only happens after years of, of working on it and trying and practicing, and that's what people don't see. They don't see the, the years before somebody is – somebody's, you know, overnight success takes three years. That's how long an, a night is in overnight success. Um, so, the, and, and what helped me with that structure is I, I, could, I could plot out a novel and put all the points that I needed to in, in the proper place. And then I could say today, I'm going to write my hero from this point to this point over here where I know he's got to go. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on. And here we go. And then I would just start getting those those things down. And once you really get in, I, and I found a groove, it's a typing groove, like my fingers just start going crazy. Um, but right before our interview, uh, and you were asking me about how I pump out those words, and, and they come out because I'm immersed in the world, I do big blocks of time, and I make sure that when I'm in the zone, you know, whatever people talk about, about being in the zone, there's a writing zone too, where you're just, you're writing your best stuff, and why would you want to stop? That's my question. Why would you want to stop when you get in that zone and you're writing your best stuff? Like stopping that is just, to me, that's crazy because now you've got your production level up. It's like starting the assembly line in a factory. You know, everybody's got to get the place warmed up and spinning and going and, and, and they got to, you know, I, I made a different analogy where, where um, construction crews, and I worked on a construction crew, for the first half hour, they don't do anything but unload tools and turn on machines and plug things in and get things ready to go. They don't pound nails or put boards up or do any of that stuff until all that's done. And then that's why they do 10 hour days is because at the end of it, they got to do another teardown, which may take 30 to 45 minutes of non-production, non-work time. And that's why I immerse myself and get so many words out. Um, and the structure, really writing to structure helps me to not waste effort in because sometimes you can get a tangent going and you have no idea how to drag it back to the story. And if you have a structure to work from then you know, there's two schools of thought on writing fiction, pantsers and, and structure people. And they will both say that the other people don't 
really know. But I think there's, there's a little bit of both in each side where the structure people will write by the seat of their pants a little bit because they'll go off their target when they find something they really love. And, and then they'll go adjust their, their outline. And, and really, they're pantsing at that point, but just putting the outline back so they can get it under control. And pantsers, you can't really write a great story unless you have some elements in it that exist you know, since Aristotle was writing these four, the, these four pieces of a hero's journey are in it, every, just about every story ever told, even. So, so, I mean, I want to, I want to make sure I stay on your question. So is that answering your, your question yeah, about does. word and, count? Yeah, it does. And it sounds like you've, you discovered the, the structure that you're, that you're going through. Then you also kind of immerse yourself in that world. And the follow up question would be a couple things. So, um, how do you facilitate that time? You talked about getting in flow and getting in that writing zone. A would be how do you facilitate that and make sure that that happens more often? And then B would be how do you personally keep the discipline to not only write consistently, but write for long periods of time? I, I think that if you're going to write, you have to decide that writing is important to you. And a lot of the things I wrote about in the first nonfiction book were about, look, if you're really a writer or if you're really anything, if you're a ditch digger or you're a, you're a concert pianist, if, you, if that's what you are and that's what you want to go and be, then you're going to have to dedicate time to it. There's no better gauge. There's two, two gauges to tell how serious somebody is about, uh, about going to do something. One is time. Will they take their time and, and use it on that? on that individual thing. The second one, as we all know, you and I both, is money. If you put time and money into something, that's what you really care about. If you just continue to say, well, I wish I could write a novel or I wish I could write a book, but I really don't have the time, that's a just totally, Americans especially watch an average of four hours of television a day. Turn it off and you have four hours a day. In fact, I wrote this line, which is, if you turn off your TV, congratulations, you will have a novel in 22.5 days. So turn off the television, there's your time. And people say that, well, that's too trivial, I can't. Yes, you can. Everybody goes to bed at 9 or 10, even in a family. I got two small daughters. You know, my, my house shuts down at 9 o'clock, 9.30. It's, you know, my wife's in bed, my kids are in bed. And I look around and go, I got two choices, Game of Thrones or I'm writing. And, and if I'm writing, a, if I'm writing a novel at that, at that, if that's my week to write a novel, then I'm writing, you know, um, I think that getting immersed in the world for me is about blocking off a day. And my wife and I negotiate that each week. And I say, okay, I need to I need at least three days this week of hardcore writing. You tell me when I can have those. And so I take those three days. I'm out of the house at 4.30 in the morning. I go to the coffee shop. I sit there. I don't move until it's about, about 5.30 or 6. I start to burn down. And I force myself. Sometimes I'll force myself to 7. But most of the time, I'm just like, okay, I'm burning out. This is going to start sucking. And I just quit. And then I look at, and then I always look at word count. I'm like a word count, like fiend. So I always look at word count. I'm like, okay, 12, five, that's not bad. We can go home. And if it's nine, I'm like, uh, uh, you're, you got to get another thousand. That's it. Um, so it's just, I, I, I have fun with it. I have fun with, with word count and I enjoy cranking, um, words out and, and I enjoy the process. It's mine is physically exhausting the way I do it. You know what? You know what was also cool about the Russell Blake, and, and this is what drove me to his site, was um, there's a thing I got to get, and it is a stand-up desk that goes over a treadmill. And it's so awesome. I'm like, I, I'm begging my wife to, for, for us to put it in our house because this stand-up desk is like goes, goes right over treadmill, and it's, it wraps around you so you can just walk and type. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the way I'm going to work out right there. Because you don't lose anything, right? Every time my wife says go work out, I'm like, that's, that's an hour's worth of writing time. I can't go do that. Um, so so I, I put myself in the world. I, I challenge myself to do uh, more than I can. And, uh, you know, I feel good at the end of the day about stopping because I didn't, you know, candy acid or, or put in a half effort. Um, Got it. So you're shooting for writing goals. You're putting yourself in an atmosphere like a coffee shop or something. That's kind of the, where you go there. You mentally go to your writing place and yeah. you're setting those things in place so that it's consistency, but then also you have a goal to, to reach for. And, 
and I think people need to find a sacred space to write in, you know, find that place where you put out the best output. I write everywhere. I'll write in my van waiting for my kids to get out of school. I'll write, you know, I don't want to say it on your show, but I've written in some places. Um, and, but the, my favorite is a coffee shop because the buzz, it's kind of white noise on a TV, which pushes out everything else. Like I don't hear anybody talk and I don't, I don't feel distracted in my mind because the, my hearing sense is in a con it's got a constant buzz going on in it. So my thought process and my eyeballs can work on my computer when I'm in dead silence. It's much tougher because any noise like stops my train of thought and makes me want to deal with that noise. But in a coffee shop, it's very, and it's so cliched for writers, right? Like you go, yeah, you write in a coffee shop. Um, but I found that I really like it because of that fact that it's this buzz of movement. And, and so I can kind of tunnel vision into my story. And, and quite frankly, there have been some characters that have come out of people that have walked into coffee shops that I'm like, oh, that guy is crazy. And so I'm putting him right in my book. <laughs> so keep yeah. away from Steve when he's writing. <laughs> yeah, you know. Awesome. Well, uh, there's some great tips here. And before we move on to the nonfiction side of things and, and how that differs, um, what, how did self-publishing school help in all that? Like when, when you started in the beginning and you got serious about writing, like you were talking about, I have a feeling you were talking about putting your money where your mouth is and your time where your mouth is, but how did yeah. that help with that? Yeah. And then, and you know, that's what we just said, right? Uh, I, I, I got to the point where I, I knew I could crank out words. The story was decent. I had a few people look at it, but it was way too long and it was, it, it, I didn't really know how to market it. And what you find out is being a writer, being a, being a hardcore writer and a good writer is a maybe, let's say it's 25% of the journey. Okay. The rest of it now is going to be, there is such a monstrous supply of information, entertainment, not even only in books, but there, but, but the buzz that is around human beings is so huge that you have to force your way into that, into their sphere of, of recognition or whatever you want to call it. You got to get in front of their eyeballs. And in order to do that, you have to know something about marketing. So self-publishing school for me was, all right, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I got in the master's program because it was enough money to make me say, I'm not going to fool around and not consume this information. And I think that, that a lot of times, and you and I've had this conversation about price points, um, but a lot of times people will buy things and not use them because they didn't cost enough. There wasn't enough opportunity cost in that money to make force them to use it. So I paid my money, I got in and I said, I'm just going to crank. I'm going to use this as the excuse why I cannot not figure out how to do this. Um, so I wrote another book inside self publishing school and I had had another one almost packaged up, but had no idea what to do with it. So I took those two books in the first round and I, and I wrote the, wrote the second one while I was in the school and I packaged the first one while I was in the school and went through all the marketing steps for those and was able to push it up the charts doing exactly the same things we were doing with nonfiction books. But fiction ends up being a little bit more long haul game um, because you're solving a different problem with a fiction book than you are a nonfiction book. So I really, I cranked out two, two books. The community was awesome because, because I got a lot of encouragement for cranking out word count. And, um, I kind of got, I got infamous in there in the community for doing that stuff. And, and I think it helped challenge other people to say, Hey, you know, there's no reason I can't put out 5,000 words today. There's no, there's no upper limit on what you can do. Yeah, you know, everybody says write a thousand words a day or write 500 words a day and then you're okay. Everything will be okay. But some days, man, you should put, you should challenge yourself to put out 5,000 words or you should challenge yourself to take a weekend and put out 20,000 words or whatever it may be. Um, I just had a student in our last class that, that did 54,000 words in her first novel and she was just like, she could not believe that she actually wrote them all. And I said, yeah, you know, you're a human being. Human beings can do a lot of stuff. Um, so there's no That's reason. Great. Now let's you know, let's transition over into because so, you had all this success, all this word count. So first off, I want to get into the why um, you switched over to right, doing some nonfiction stuff, and then and then we'll follow up by getting into the methods and how that differed from fiction. 
Um, the, the why is pretty easy. I, I started reading all about all of the successful guys who were, who were self-publishing, and I read a piece of advice that basically said, you need to not worry about marketing until you have about 10 fiction books, until you have a, a backlist of books that, that, number one, is going to make you a better writer, number two is going to make you a more legitimate writer, and number three, we'll give you more things to sell to people when you start building. You know, you need to build an audience right off the bat. But fiction is a very, it's, it's a very packed with, um, with very powerhouse authors. And uh, there's a lot of it out there. And there's a lot of success going on. And the, and the dynamic is changing, right? Now you're seeing all these New York Times authors who have had, you know, New York Times bestseller success. And what they're figuring out is, oh my God, all of my readers are going online and using and buying ebooks. And so now they're down into the indie publishing routine just like you are. So you're not only fighting with other indies, you're you're fighting with Stephen King every day of your life. And you've got to figure out it's just a different sell. And I think it's a different eventually fiction will make a bunch more money than nonfiction when you once you figure it out. Um, but it's a long haul game, and and that's what I keep reading over and over again. I think you can probably make it work quicker, but you may you may not you may burn out before you get there. What I found out was I was I was writing really fast. I was pumping out books. I was finding some people that really liked them, but I couldn't get them in a spot where I could get people to to buy them and buy into me because fiction is. So I made, I made this comparison, whereas if I write a nonfiction book and you have a problem and I write a book about solving that problem for you, our exchange is, I solved your problem and you paid me three bucks or four bucks or whatever it may be. So for problem solving, that's a huge ROI. I've solved the problem for you. It may be big or maybe small, whatever, but you only had to pay four bucks to get that done. Perfect. You know, the, the exchange is, is wonderful. In fiction... You have to take the risk that I don't suck, and you, your, your risk is you have to give me 10 hours of your life so that you can determine whether or not I suck or I'm your type of writer. That is a much different, and really, you are, your problem, you're still solving problems with fiction. The, the problem is boredom, okay? Boredom, entertainment, excitement, you know, adventure. You're solving these problems, but the core problem is boredom, and people who read anyway solve that problem a lot of times and and it's escapism and entertainment but think about why you watch a movie do you do you like those three hour epics sometimes even the best ones you know you're like oh my god you know we're three hours into this George R. R. or this J.R. Tolkien you know Hobbit festival and I'm really burning out could you guys wrap it up um, <laughs> and, you know and you've paid you've heck you've paid 25 bucks to go in there and you got kids you paid like ding near a hundred um, but, but that's really the difference was, and, and the reason I decided to do some nonfiction was number one, we were coming across all of these students and all of these people I was talking to online who were like, I have no idea where to start. I don't know how to, I don't know any of this stuff. And I think there's three stages in writing. Number one, you have to get over the fear that you're going to suck. You have to believe that you can go and do it. So you get through that and then you're like, okay, now what? And then there's the problem that you solve, which is in self-publishing school, which is there's mechanics to all of this. There's a process, procedure, and a map that you can follow to make a book. And that's mechanics. Now, that's not, you're not going to, that has nothing to do with marketing and, and entertainment and selling. And it is mechanics to get you, to get you put in the right place. Now, whether you're a good writer or not and you engage people is, is practice and practice and practice. And so that part is the third part in fiction, which you got to do over and over and over again. But in nonfiction, you get through, if you get through your writer fear, then you get to mechanics. And if you can find a problem that people have and solve it with those mechanics, you know, they're, they're pretty lenient and forgiving in the nonfiction world with structure and grammar and things like that. You know, got to get professional editors, but 
there aren't people who are saying, well, that was, you know, your nonfiction book had flat characters and you didn't know anything about the arc of a story or, you, you know, you don't, you don't deal with those problems. You're, you're like, I give you bits of information that solve your problems and we put it in a, in a logical fashion and that's a pretty decent nonfiction book. So got it. And I guess to, to kind of recap all that, and then we'll move into some mechanics um, and some of the stuff that you, that you use. It's, there's way more fiction. I mean, there's way more money inside of fiction, but it is a longer term game that's top heavy. Um, and then the nonfiction, there's still a good bit of money, but you're quicker to the cash when you do it. Now, when you made that switch over, what were the biggest differences? Was it hard at first? And what are kind of the differences in how you write on the nonfiction side as opposed to the fiction side? You know, it's funny because I haven't written a stitch of fiction in four months. And uh, because I turned my brain turned over to nonfiction because your brain turns to this analytical problem solving mechanical side that it has to structure things correctly, deliver information in a succinct matter manner and and really solve problems as you go. So it's very structured for me in, in terms it's not I won't say it's not creative because it absolutely is creative. It's a creative process, but it's a completely different side of your brain that I think that has to be used. And so just like switching back and forth, back and forth, like I could never write two books at once. I would not want to do that. I would not want to write a fiction book at the same time I was writing a nonfiction book because they would both just be horrible. And what I, what I found was for my first nonfiction, I had to stop like forcefully stop myself from being a fiction writer because I wanted to be too colorful, too descriptive, too, too, you know, um, uh, you know, those are the words, colorful and descriptive, right? You wanted to be too entertaining, right? You want to be too entertaining when people are coming there to get information and problem solved. Yeah, we tell stories at the beginning of a fiction or a nonfiction book so that we identify with, with the reader. But after that, they're just like, okay, get your story out of my way so that I can get in here and solve this problem. And, and I find that I get that feedback early on, which was, you know, you're telling us too much. I, I don't want all this fluff. I want the meat in this book. And so I turned my nonfiction books to meat really quick um, when I find, got some of that feedback. Um, so I think the difference is that, that you're just using different creative sides of your brain to do, to do those two things. It's very tough for me to go from, from writing fiction to nonfiction. Um, Lisa and I actually did this when we were outlining the book for my outlining book, you know, whatever. Um, but I brainstormed a story with her for three hours on a hangout while we were outlining the out, the how to outline a novel book. And it was this weird like thing where you're, you're having to like have all these crazy ideas at the same time you're trying to put them in a box, each all them where they're supposed to go inside a nonfiction book. So it was kind of, it kind of came out like I was telling the story, but I was showing you how to do something while I was telling you the story. And it, it's, it's a wild book. People love it, but it was, it was difficult. It was difficult to do. Yeah. Um, so what's, what's been this, uh, like what's been the, the big differences or the su success, like since kind of sw swapping over. And I know, I know because we've talked that you have plans where it's like, okay, I've got these fiction books. I mean, these nonfiction books that I'm going to go through and I'm going to get those out and then I'm going back to fiction. But what's been the big difference since uh, switching over to nonfiction? I know the books have been taken off on the nonfiction side um, and just kind of walk us through some of that. I, I think there's just, you know, as you've seen and as a, as a ton of, of people have seen, there's a big, I don't want to call it a market, but there is an unfulfilled need out there for a lot of people who, and what do you say? I mean, your, your statistics in your book were 87% of the people who want to write a book and only 1% of those people ever do it. Well, that's an untapped, you know, total need in a market that, that needs a lot of different, number one, they need motivation. Number two, they need information, how to get it all done. And number three, they need help and encouragement to get that done. So like, you know, self-publishing school provides three of those. I write books to provide mechanics and, and motivation in, in a couple of those. And what I saw was that that untapped market, because I was communicating with that, those people already, I was already in, in, I was one of them. And I think one of the best things was, I wish I would have had my own books when I first started, 
because every writer author book that I read just talked about inner muse and child and 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 you know all these esoteric ethereal feelings that came out of, of an MFA school and it was like you're not telling me how to do this stuff so I wrote books that said this is how it's written I'm not saying I'm telling you how to be the best writer in the world I'm telling you here's the mechanics here's the structure here's the grammar here's the fictions you know here's what, what dialogue looks like here's what exposition looks like here's what action beats look like and here's how you can punctuate all that stuff and so at that point people were starved for that information and I gave it to them am I the best authority on it well I'll tell you what the authorities weren't providing that information so I'm becoming the authority and I gave myself permission to do that that's another thing we talk about in in the school it was like you know the beauty of the internet and the beauty of the new economy is you don't need permission from anybody to do damn near anything and so you is if you do it and people like what you do even if some people don't like it then guess what you get to do it um, so I so I did it and and the immediate thing that I saw was my confidence level that writing was going to be something that I could do went up because I saw that if if I just figured out the formula for me because everybody's is going to be different that I would I would be successful because I knew how to apply hard work and determination to it I just need to know the path you know where do you want the ditch dug because I know how to dig, dig ditches but I just need to know what field we need to be digging in to find all the gold and um, it, it, it it ended up happening pretty quickly like the first month I started making some serious money and then it's kind of leveled out where you it it also becomes a long haul game because books go up and then they float down and then they go up and then they float down but as part of it like other things have happened like I design book covers for people because I love to do that stuff I coach coach other writing students because I'm, I've figured out the formulas so well and gone through the school with you guys and so like all the things around it start happening that you don't know will happen until you go do it you know people get asked to speak they get asked to go on podcasts they you know all these things start swirling when you put the put the the machine in motion um, that you will never know until you write those words and put that machine in motion you won't know what comes out of your book your book might not sell anything but it might get you a job or it might get you it, it might get you on a, somebody's podcast and and then all of a sudden it might get you a speaking engagement and then you know they it just the you don't have the opportunities that you have at, before you write these things and and once you do like things open up that you would have never seen before i know this happened to you guys big time right you know you sat for a week in a cabin and wrote a book and all of a sudden holy cow right you're up yeah. you're up talking to you know lewis howe yeah I'll, it's 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 funny because you're 100 percent preaching to the choir right now uh, i find myself just wanting to be like hey, man, hey. <laughs> but it it really is those opportunities don't start until you start and just by simply getting started and going through that process then your eyes open to all these things that you never would have imagined would happen and like you said that might be books that might be a podcast that might be speaking that might even be a job that your boss said wait what is it wait a second this person has written a book this person hasn't okay i'm gonna hire i'm gonna hire you but none of those things start until you get started i think that's a great great way to kind of bring this interview to a close um and what i do want to a couple things before we close out um the first being what would be your parting tip um, your parting writing tip or just tip in general for people thinking about getting started on their journey and thinking about writing their first book I, I think uh, I, there, there's a there's an old cliched quote from somebody it's what when was the best time to plant a tree and that was 25 years ago when you should have planted it and what's the second best time to plant a tree and it's today so I think that that really what what people need to do is if they've just been longing to write a book forever just do it just I, I mean there there are lots and lots of courses self-publishing school is a great course to do it in and what you find is it's easier when you get a community I, I, I think that would be my best piece of advice you a commute find a community of other authors who are at the same place you are with the same fears the same needs the same 
everything. They have the same everything. And you will not see what you see in your everyday life when you say, I want to write a book. And you get back that look from people like, oh, you're just nuts. What you'll get is, heck, yeah, you want to write a book. You should write like three books. That's what you'll get inside a community of people who think like you. And that will keep you, that will get your first book written faster than you will ever, ever get it written by yourself. That, and, and that's not a plug for a school. That's just simply the way it is. A community of people who are doing the same thing you're doing, encouraging you, make you go so much faster and so much better and, and more effective. Um, that's what I found. I think I paid the money for the community. I mean, I mean there, was, there was valuable material, but when I, when I look back on it, um, you know, the, the value I got the most was other people who were around me doing the same type of journey and the same struggle that I was in. And that made it easy. You know, when everybody else is rowing hard in a boat, you know why you're rowing. Mm-hmm. And they'll look at you if you're not rowing and tell you to start rowing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you look next to the guy next to you and he's spinning the boat because he's rowing so hard. <laughs> That's great. Well, Steve, really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your writing tips, both fiction and nonfiction. And I'm sure there are people uh, listen to this who want to learn more into this story structure, want to hear more about the process because we only had so much time uh, to go through that in this interview. So how can they find out more about your books and how can they find out more about you? Um, if, if you go to Amazon and look under Steve Windsor author, then all my books come up or uh, stevewindsor.com is where I got all my fiction books right now. And I'm using Vixen Inc, V-I-X-E-N-I-N-K.com as a landing kind of landing page for all my nonfiction stuff. But that's going to change pretty soon. Um, so the so the best way to do it is go over to stevewindsor.com and you'll see you'll see all my fiction stuff. Or go on Amazon. You know that's where you see most everybody's books anyway, right? Um, awesome. So. Well, Steve, hey man, thank thanks so much for coming on and keep up the great work. I know you're inspiring our students and inspiring just a lot of people to fight the good fight and keep churning out words um, and keeping on this journey and you're staying focused on that. So thanks for coming on. It was great All having right. you. Thanks, man. Thanks for, thanks for having me. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.